Welcome to Second Nephi 6 through 10, episode 8. We're going to talk about the restoration of the house of Israel, or an Isaiah unbridled. And I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And we're just going to say, take it away. And we're doing Isaiah. So. I'm going to not hold back today. We're going to jump right in. And um, I just want to make sure everybody knows that there's absolutely no personal affront or offense intended. We, we offend everybody equally. So <laughs> with that, let's look at what the text says. Um, there are three measures of time that we need to be familiar with in Scripture. These are, um, these are from the prophetic appointments. If you study the agricultural uh, feasts and the, and the cycle in Israel and the seven prophetic appointed times that the Lord gave us in Leviticus chapter 23 and the law of Moses, then you can see that the ancient ordinances in the temple were types and shadows of prophecy. And so there are a lot of videos on our website regarding that, but just to do it simple and fast, we're going to go with the uh, rabbi's commentary on the Ethiopian Orthodox Epistle of Elijah, because I think it's dang fascinating what they say. They say that there are actually four ages in the history of this temporal existence of the earth, and the first one was the Age of Chaos. This would be your antediluvian, pre-flood um, age, and they called it the Age of Chaos in this ancient document. The next age was called the Age of Torah, and of course this would be from Mount Sinai to the coming of Christ. Well, it even from Abraham in a way. Yeah, it, it really was <clears throat> from Abraham and, fo and forward because um, it's the history of the, the Hebrew people as a nation. And uh, that was about a 2,000 year period. And then the next period of time that's specified is called in the Epistle of Elijah, the Age of Grace. This is what we know of as the time of the Gentile. So in the scriptures, again, if you look up things that say fullness of time, it will take you to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Whereas if you put an S on fullness of time and get fullness of times, then you are looking at the millennial day. You're looking at the last dispensation, the fullness of times. Now, that in the epistle of Elijah is called the millennial kingdom. And you can see that we have brides here. That we have the bride of Christ that was Israel in the Old Testament, the bride of Jehovah. And then in the time of the Gentiles, in Acts 15, it said, um, Peter said that the Lord would take out of the Gentiles a people, and that people would be the church. And it, as the gospel went to the nations, this time of the Gentiles period, that is often referred to in scripture as two days, um, a day being a thousand years, so this is approximately 2,000. These, these time of the Gentiles, uh, the age of chaos, and the age of grace are 2,000 years each. Now we see these same measures of time in Jacob chapter 5, which we'll be studying very shortly. And it is, we see the first visit, then the second visit, and the third visit. And all of these time periods are these prophetically appointed time markers like we we saw there there are three branches of the house of Israel that will follow and then as you can see on the right hand side of your slide there's this fullness of the Gentiles and this time of the restoration of the house of Israel this is what Nephi is going to call in the Book of Mormon and the Jesus Christ and Jacob all of them will call this restoration of the house of Israel, including the fullness of the Gentiles that commences it and lays the foundation for it, this period of time is called the great and marvelous work. We see the same thing in Jacob chapter 5. We have a tree that was diseased and now in the end time we have the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel and this is the restoration of the house of Israel. I should come into that slide again. 
Let's do that again because I need to not click and let you see the first part of the slide. Sorry. In Jacob 5, it starts out where there is a tree, that, an olive tree, and it's decaying. And we remember that there are three separate branches that get broken off from that tree and they get scattered. One will be when the ten tribes in the north are taken captive into Assyria. And the next one will be when Jerusalem itself falls to Babylon. And of course your third branch is Lehi himself and them coming to the American continent. So we have three branches in Jacob 5 and then we also know that there's branches that get grafted into the tree during these captivities and and this during this history and these branches that are grafted into the tree are wild branches but they will become in the end time when the bad branches are burned in the tree and the part of the gentiles that rebel against the gospel are all destroyed we have the Gentiles that were faithful that are grafted into the tree. The same story is in Jacob ch chapter 5, this whole three periods of time. We see it also in Isaiah chapter 54. Again, we have the bride that was married in the Lord's youth, and then she is cut off. And at this time, it would be in our time period when at the first coming of Christ, the fig tree was cursed because it didn't have any fruit. They had the gospel. It was full of leaves, but they chose not to be willing to bring the gospel to the Gentiles when the Lord said it was now time. And so because of that, Israel was cut off. They rejected their, the words of Christ through Jesus Christ. And then we came into the time when the gospel was taken to the nations. Again, this is a summer harvest. This is the time of the wheat, the wheat and the tares, when the gospel is taken to the Gentiles. It's represented in the feasts or the prophetic appointed times as Pentecost or Shavuot in Hebrew. And then that millennial period, that restoration of, house of, of the house of Israel, when the church bride apostatizes and the Israel bride comes back with those that are of the church that are faithful and stay with them and they're numbered with Israel in that grand fruitful end time period called the millennial day and of course this is the parable of the fig tree that we're so told that we need to understand we saw in 2 Nephi chapter 3 that Joseph of Egypt was given prophecies regarding restorations and deliverances that will happen with his posterity. And the first one chronologically that he would see would be Moses, his descendant. And Moses would deliver Israel from Egypt and bring forth the words of God. And because Jesus says in 3 Nephi that he's the one that gave that law, to Moses. They are the words of Christ. The reason I'm emphasizing the words of Christ is because it becomes key in the Book of Mormon scenario here. So notice that Moses brings forth the words of Christ and that he delivers Israel. Of course, he's not the Savior. Remember that in 2 Nephi 3, Joseph of Egypt was told that the Messiah would not come from his lineage. But Moses is told in Deuteronomy that there would be a prophet that would rise up that if you did not hear his words, you would be cut off. So those that do not hear the words of Christ in the Book of Mormon are cut off over and over and over again. It's those words. You must hear the words of Christ. And we'll show you these, these word links in just a minute. We're getting a little bit of an overview here. Now, of course, Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. And when he was rejected, just like we said before, the gospel went to the Gentiles and that big tree was cursed. The next person that Joseph of Egypt sees in 2 Nephi 3 is we have the restoration through the prophet Joseph Smith. We have Joseph's descendant, Joseph, whose father's name is Joseph. 
And during this period of time, during the restoration, we're told in DNC 45 that the fig tree is beginning to leaf out again with the gospel. Now, the third one that Joseph of Egypt sees in 2 Nephi 3 is this end time servant. And the, the way the, the, the guys, the characters look on the screen means nothing, okay? <laughs> When we were studying Isaiah, we did a puppet show and we did finger puppets for all the different characters. And this is Jack and the bad guy, the king of Assyria, was the giant in Jack and the Beanstalk. So <laughs> I, I, I have not <laughs> tried to make a picture of this end time character that brings forth the words of Christ. But you will see him often as I symbolize him, as we're talking about him in the scriptures, our puppet guy. And here he is bringing forth, and that book says, words of Christ on, on the beginning, because this is all word linking, okay? So again, in Second Nephi 3, we saw the same thing. We saw the period of time at the end of the time of the Gentiles, when you have someone bringing forth the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, the words of Christ on the large place of Nephi that we are promised in the Book of Mormon would come forth and that would convince the house of Israel of their, their Savior and their Messiah. So that part is still to come. And that person is more of a mystery. But he is definitely one spoken of that is part of the restoration of of the house of Israel in the Book of Mormon. And this period of time, the fullness of the Gentiles, again, where Joseph Smith commences the work and lays the foundation for it so that there are missionaries, kings and queens of the Gentiles, who will go forth when those words come forth in the, from Adam on Diamond, actually, in the restoration of the house of Israel when they come into their promised lands and they believe and are convinced. So let's take a look at it in the text. The sealed portion coming forth is in 2 Nephi 27. The Lord tells Joseph Smith, Touch not the things which are sealed, for I will bring them forth in mine own due time. When you see that, that's not just any time the Lord wants. That is like a in the terms time. of a pregnancy, the baby it has a due time. And so it just means that it is important enough that the Lord knows exactly when this time is, is going to come forth. Now, the Lord says something very interesting here. And he, sa he says, For I will show unto the children of men that I am able to do my own work. And I think that that is foundational when we're talking about this great and marvelous work because if you read the converse of that what's it saying somebody I haven't been doing well directly somebody's saying that god can't do that uh, he needs our permission first that, that that's not that that's not the way we said it should happen right uh, you're gonna see that that when Samuel the Lamanite comes, it's that same kind of logic, that same kind of argument is going to come forward. And the Lord is saying very clearly about the sealed portion, I don't need your permission and I don't need your help. I can do it the way I've always known that it was going to happen. And so the reason I say that is because we need to shake up our little, our little box in our head of how we think things have to go down, and we need to trust the scriptures. We need to look at what they're saying. And the Lord is making it very clear, I am able to do mine own work. Wherefore, when thou hast read the words which I have commanded thee, and obtained the witnesses that I have promised unto thee, thou shalt seal up the book again, and hide it up unto me that I may preserve the words which thou hast not read until I see fit in mine own wisdom, which is another linking word to the day of wisdom that Samuel Lamanite is going to talk about, to reveal all things. So again, there's a period of time here where things that we don't have yet are going to be revealed. Therefore, I will proceed 
to do a marvelous work. Yea, a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise and their learned will perish and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. Now, of course, Joseph Smith is going to begin this, this great and this marvelous work. But again, it's not done until the rest of it is revealed. And the Lord makes it very clear that he will do that in his own way because he is able to do his own work. Now, this part I think is really fascinating. This is the three Nephites in 3rd Nephi 28. And this is a chiasm. So we've talked about chiasms before. The first and the last element are kind of the title and the middle is the main point. So the title and they are angels of God, and if they shall pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus, they can show themselves under whatever man seemeth them good. This is the three Nephites. And then at the bottom of the, of the, uh, excuse me, the bottom of the chiasm, and now behold, as I spake concerning those whom the Lord had chosen, yea, even the three who were caught up into the heavens. So that's three Nephites again. So there, this is a chiasm title about the three Nephites. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's just jump down to the center of the chiasm and see what we're saying about the three ne Nephites. It says, And if ye had all the scriptures which give an account of the marvelous works of Christ, so we've got the great and marvelous works right there in verse 31 and right here in the center, and again, we're talking about the words of Christ. You would, according to the words of Christ, know that these things must surely come. So here is where we kind of get that the three Nephites have something to do with the coming forth of the words of Christ, the greater things that are on the large place of Nephi. You remember in the Book of Mormon, it says that in our lesser part of the Book of Mormon, we have not one one hundredth of what he taught the people. Those are recorded on the large plates of Nephi which are in the sealed portion. So again, we're getting clues and pieces, but notice the consistency of the words, the words of Christ, the great and marvelous work, and that the sealed portion is part of this great and marvelous work. Now, we talked about in the last one, this is just a quick review, that Nephi made a great and marvelous sandwich. Sandwich is just my mnemonic for the kids about bracketing. Bracketing, just imagine you put a book in on two ends of a section of books and what the, that selection of books is, is all contained in the middle. So whenever you see brackets in scripture, it could be a chiasm. It could be a chiasm that you're looking for, or it could be something even greater like Nephi's prophetic visions that are bracketing the great and marvelous work. We see that he is talking about a great reversal. He is talking about a time when you have the destruction of the Gentile nations that don't believe and the deliverance of the house of Israel. And those chapters are quoting Isaiah chapter 48 and 49, hook, line, and seeker. So let's take a look at a couple of those verses. Here's the one where we saw in 1 Nephi 14, verse 7, that the time cometh that I will work a great and marvelous work. That's why we call this the great marvelous work sandwich. That's when it's introduced. And we learned that, the, that when this work comes forth, maybe it starts with the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. I don't know. But when this work comes forth, there's going to be a division. Either on the one hand, or on the other, depending on whether you harden your heart at this time. And then notice in this context of the great and marvelous work being introduced, the Lord says in verse 8, Rememberest thou the covenants of the Father unto the house of Israel? And then, of course, Nephi is forbidden to tell us more. In which case, he pulls out Isaiah to tell us anyway, if we're paying attention. All right, so here is the last part of the great and marvelous 
bracket in 1 Nephi 22, where he says, the Lord God will proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles. So this is our, our bracketing of what the marvelous work is. And then Nephi gives us a little chiasm. You can see that in the in element B, we have the gospel going to the house of Israel up above and then down below. His covenants and his gospel go unto those who are of the house of Israel. Notice the covenants always involved with the restoration of the house of Israel. And notice that it's always a restoration. Here is element A. And this is kind of interesting because we're going to see Jacob, Jesus, and Nephi talk about this period of time when the Gentiles are going to carry the house of Israel on their shoulders, the kings and the queens of the Gentiles. Wherefore, it's likened unto their being nourished by the Gentiles and be carried upon their arms and upon their shoulders. So here's a question. If you've got Gentiles that are actually supporting the house of Israel and carrying them on their shoulders, why did the Gentiles get destroyed? Unbelief. And Two roads. Yeah, it's, it's that split that he's talking about, the great division. Are there, there going to be believing Gentiles and there'll be unbelieving Gentiles? And this is over and over and over again in the Book of Mormon, especially in Isaiah. Now, the center of the chiasm, this is super important. We've got to pay attention to the linking words in these structures that the prophets are trying so meticulously to, to design for us so that we can see. He says in the middle that all of the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless the Lord makes bare his arm. Wherefore, the Lord will proceed to make bare his arm, says it twice, in the eyes of all nations. And so we have, we're told this is the great and marvelous work. We're told that the title is when the Gentiles that do believe are going to assist Israel and carry them. But we're told in the center that it's when he makes bare his arm. Now, arms in Isaiah are special keywords, and you can pick it up right here in Isaiah 51, which Jacob is going to quote in the next chapter. Listen to me, my people, give heed to me, my nation. The law shall go forth from me, and my precepts shall be a light to the peoples. Then suddenly I will act. This is very interesting because this marvelous work seems to be suddenly in the scriptures. And then he says in verse 5, my righteousness will be at hand, my salvation will proceed, my arms shall touch the people. The isles anticipate me awaiting my arm. And so here we have in Isaiah a definition of the two arms. God's arms are righteousness and salvation. And those become keywords, pseudonyms. You can't just go in the scriptures and say, oh, well, I think the arm is this, or I think the hand is this. You have to be able to link it up. You have to be able to show it in parallel in the text. You can't just make it up. So look at this text right here that, that um, Nephi was actually quoting in the Great and Marvelous Sandwich when he quoted chapter 48, for the destruction and 49 for the deliverance. He was showing this great reversal of the house of Israel and the Gentiles at the time of the great and marvelous work. He says, mine hand hath laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand hath spanned the heavens. And then down below it says that his arm will be against or come upon the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Now let's go in and just play a little game just to show you how it works in the scriptures that you can't guess around. You have to be faithful and diligent about your linking. So the statement here is that the right hand that we just read about is the same as the mighty arm. 
Let's take a look and see if it's in parallel. We're in Isaiah 62, verse 8. And he says, the Lord has sworn by his right hand, his mighty arm. Okay, so can, can we say the right hand is his mighty arm? It, it's right there in the text. The Lord said it. Not me, not Avraham Gileadi. No, it's in the text. Okay, all right, let's look at another one. So the arm is the right hand. Here we go in Isaiah 63, verse 12. Who made his glorious arm proceed at the right hand of Moses. Okay, so we have arm and right hand, and it's linked in the text. We're not just guessing this. This arm and this right hand, that's the same person that we're talking about. Okay, the arm, one of the arms is salvation. We just kind of saw that right there in, in Isaiah 51, but here it is in Isaiah 59. So his own arm brought about salvation for him. His righteousness rallied to the cause. Remember, we just saw that the two arms were righteousness and salvation. Here you can see that the righteous arm comes first. It's getting ready for salvation. The arm brought about the salvation. And of course, salvation is the name of Jesus. Yeshua in English is salvation. So this righteous arm is preparing the way for Jesus, salvation to come. And it's in the text. All right, just one more. We actually have on our website, in our Isaiah classes, an entire lesson on code names and pseudonyms in Isaiah. And there's bad guys, too, that have code names and pseudonyms. And, and it's lots of fun. But here's one more that we need to know for our Great Marvelous Sandwich. The arms are righteousness and salvation. Again, we just saw this one in 51. Farrell, go ahead and read it. My righteousness shall be at the hand of my salvation. Proceed. My arms shall judge the people. The islands anticipate me awaiting my arm. So this arm, these arms, it's a person. Jesus is salvation. The righteousness is at hand. And then salvation proceeds after the righteousness has prepared the way. And they, the two arms will judge the people. We're going to see that in Zechariah again in just a little while. All right. In, in the book Isaiah Illustrated that you've seen before, charts in the back, they actually have charts of all the code names and pseudonyms that are in Isaiah, that Isaiah uses to link things up. And of course, Jacob and Nephi, they're quoting Isaiah. They're using the same words. In the back, there's a chart. And the reason I'm showing you this is because what I encourage all of my students to do is to go in your scriptures, get a yellow highlighter and a green highlighter, like soft lead pencil is what we use, and then a gray one, and mark the code names in your scriptures. Just that one exercise will totally change the book of Isaiah for you. All of a sudden, there'll be characters, there'll be people, and you'll see a completely different picture than you saw before. And remember again, we don't make these things up. We only can link what's linked in the text. All right, Nephi quoted in his great and marvelous sandwich. You can see that I chose the hamburger patty because it got burned up <laughs> for my destruction chapter in the book of Isaiah. We call them the sandwiches. All the different ingredients in the sandwich, those are each different chapters that are between the two brackets, okay? And so this is our destruction chapter, and we're not going to read it in detail, but here again you can see it was my right hand that founded the earth, my right hand, stretched out the heavens, we can see that this end time character that 2 Nephi 3 was talking about, that brings in the convincing of the house of Israel that Jesus is the Christ and bring for, brings forth the greater words of Christ that we don't have yet. It says that he was there from the beginning. We learned that Jesus was in Revelation that was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, apparently Joseph Smith, 
I mean, Joseph of Egypt is seeing Joseph Smith some 4,000 years ahead of time. Apparently, these deliver, restore figures were from the foundation of the world with their assignments. All right, so who among you foretold these things? It is him, so that hand is a him. It is him the Lord loves. He will perform his will in Babylon, and his arm will be against Babylon. Well, it's never a very popular thing to go and tell Jerusalem that it's going to get destroyed, or to tell Babylon that she's about to get the broom. And so they're not going to be very nice to him, even though the Lord says in verse 16, come near me and hear this. I have not made these predictions in secret. You would think that he had. For how we read Isaiah, how we read the Book of Mormon, we read over top of all this stuff and don't trust the plain thing that he's saying. Now, my Lord, the Lord has sent me and his spirit is in me. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. Gosh, I'm, I'm thinking of him bringing forth the sealed portion. Your Redeemer. Remember, they're going to be convinced. They're going to believe. Had you but obeyed my commandments, your peace would have been as a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been as the sands in number and descendants as many as their grains their names would not have been cut off. What did Moses say about the prophet that would come? And if you would not hear his <laughs> words, you would be cut off. cut off. That's the burger. That's burned up. That's serious stuff. We see it in DNC 56 to Joseph Smith, and he that will not take up his cross and follow me and keep my commandments, the same shall not be saved. Behold, I the Lord command, and he that will not obey will be cut off in my due time. <laughs> There's an end. There is a, you were looking up the other day in Spanish. What Moedim, or the prophetic appointed, like the feast, what it meant in Spanish, and what was it? Uh, it was, um, all of a sudden I'm... Time uh, is up. Yeah, time is up. It was... Um, Deadline. For... Deadline. <laughs> I thought you'd get it because you told me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just that you caught me. <laughs> Sorry, off guard. Like a deer thinking in the of, headlights. You could have cut off, right? Yes, it's a deadline. Due time. It's yes. Like same thing. Due time. And there, there it deadline. is in Deuteronomy to Moses. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot will slide in due time. The day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that will come upon them make haste. Huh. What did Isaiah say? Suddenly I will do my great and marvelous work. All right. Just wanted to show you really quickly in even the wilderness chapters. Nephi is quoting Isaiah when you don't know it. You know, if, if, if it's not in the title section up there at the beginning of the chapter. We, we don't know that he's quoting Isaiah, right? <laughs> Look at this one right here in 1 Nephi 19. It says, Yea, and all the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord, saith the prophet. Guess which prophet? Every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people will be blessed. Of course, he's quoting Isaiah. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. That's the arm. That's the arm of Jesus Christ. Behold, his reward is with him. And what? His work before him. is before him. Like a great and marvelous work. All of these are linking up throughout the Book of Mormon. So where is this arm coming from? Where was it first mentioned? It's in Isaiah 52, verse 10. Now, just so you know, when we get to 3 Nephi, Jesus is going to quote this entire chapter and give us a commentary on it. We don't have time to do that one today, but here it is, this verse that comes with the make bare his arm. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. So it's not going to be in secret. All of the ends of the earth shall see 
the salvation of our God. And when you do break out together into song, you ruined places of Jerusalem. Jehovah hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Turn away. Get out of Babylon. Go in haste. My servant being astute, he will become exceedingly eminent. And so shall he yet astound many nations. And kings, maybe perhaps this is the kings and the queens of the Gentiles who actually help with the restoration of the house of Israel, will shut their mouths at him. And what they had not been told, they will see. And what they had not even heard, they will consider. Now, I did skip some verses. I know you have to wait till 3rd Nephi. We'll get into it a lot more deeply. But let's just take a look here and see what Jacob is doing in 2nd Nephi 25. I'm trying to show you that these linking words are all over the Book of Mormon. Here we have another chiasm. The chiasm is about the Jews, after being scattered for many generations, being persuaded to believe in Christ. Look at the bottom. For the purpose of convincing them of the true Messiah who was rejected by them. So the name of our chiasm is, well, wait a minute. What happens when the houses, the branches of the house of Israel believe in Christ? Well, let's go to the center and see. And the Lord will set his hand again the second time to restore his people. Wherefore, he will proceed to do a marvelous work. And a wonder. That marvelous work in a wonder is persuading people to believe in Christ. It's, it's as much to the Gentiles as it is to the house of Israel. But it says that the house of Israel is going to believe. Or it says the Gentiles are going to divide. And not all of the house of Israel will believe either. As a matter of fact, Jesus gives a whole chiasm to the house of Israel in 3 Nephi. What will happen to them if they don't believe? Now Nephi says, Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord. This is actually poetry. There's a chiasm. I call it my soul delighteth chiasm in, in Nephi. The things of the Lord. And my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. Nevertheless, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord, I want you to pay attention to this line that we read over because we, we want to hurry up to the oh wretched man that I am part. <laughs> What's the part that we skipped over? Nevertheless, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord in showing me his great and marvelous works. He saw the whole thing. He saw this, his people being destroyed. He saw those of his descendants that had mingled with the Lamanites in the last days being scourged and smitten. But he also saw their restoration and their believing in Christ. And this is what his whole heart is rejoicing about, that the Lord has shown him that. Okay, we're going to see it again in 2 Nephi 28. When we get our woes of what's going on in those last days that are going to cause these Gentiles to have trouble. It says, Woe be unto the Gentiles, saith the Lord God of hosts. For notwithstanding, I will lengthen out my arm from, to them from day to day. They will deny me. Ouch. Nevertheless, I will be merciful unto them, saith the Lord God, if they will repent and come unto me. For mine arm is lengthened out all the day long, saith the Lord God of hosts. So I hope we're part of that half that repents and believes. All right, so again, we are in the three measures of time and the point that we want to look at at this time chart is we want to look at these pivotal points. Beryl mentioned last time that we did some videos called the changing of the guard. That was our way of saying, you know, it went from the Israel to the time of the Gentiles. But then there's going to be another changing of the guard when the Gentiles get cut off or numbered with the house of Israel, whichever way you choose. And then it's the restoration of the house of Israel. And we want to be part of that. We want to be part of Israel. Hey, we're Ephraimites. We want 
to remember our roots and remember what we believe. So when Jesus came at the first changing of the guard, the words of Christ were brought forth. What was the words of Christ that we received at the fullness of time when Jesus came? Well, we kept the Gospels. Yeah, the whole New Testament. The whole New Testament. <laughs> right? And remember, those that rejected it got destroyed. Okay? Literally, pretty much in 70 AD. Yeah. The exact same thing happens with the Gentiles. We will have the words of Christ. We already received the first part of them what the Book of Mormon calls the lesser part, and there are more to come forth. But if we reject those when they come forth, that leads to the burning of the tares and the end of the time of the Gentiles. Go ahead and read what Brigham Young said. When he, Jesus, him. again visited his this earth, he will come to it thoroughly purging, excuse me, he will come to thoroughly purge his kingdom from wickedness as a ruler of the nations, to dictate and administer to them as an heir to the kingdom. And the Gentiles will be as much mistaken in regard to his coming, his second advent, as the Jews were in relation to the first. We do the same thing. Which is So you have, to, well, you have to ask yourself, why? What? I, I remember one time I asked Abraham Gilead, I was sitting there talking to him, and I, I said, I don't get it. I, okay, so I, I'm at the bookstore, and there's a book, and it says, sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> you know, I'm like, who is going to reject that? You know? Well, it's I, difficult because there's already some. But. Well, well, I'm not talking about the counterfeits. You know, if, if, if Satan is wise, don't you think that he would flood the market with counterfeits Absolutely. before the real deal comes? All right, so... How could anybody reject the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, right? And Abraham looked at me and he said, We already are. How many of us take the chapters of Isaiah and breeze straight across them? We don't keep Jesus' commandment. We don't study the words of Isaiah. When I do believe that the reason Jesus commanded us to study them is because they would prepare us to accept and see his work that he doesn't need our help to do when he convinces Israel that he is their Messiah. What do we do? Well, I think Samuel the Lamanite typed it out pretty clearly in Helaman chapter 16 because he's telling them about Jesus Christ and check out the word links here. Some things they may have guessed right. These are what the, the people that don't believe. They're saying some things they may have guessed right among so many. But behold, we know that all these great and marvelous works cannot come to pass. What? <laughs> great and marvelous works. Now, of course, you see, it's going to be chiastic. You're going to have it down in the bottom to cause us that we should believe in some great and marvelous thing. Okay, so there's your, there's your great and marvelous thing. And here right in the center is why they reject it. Go ahead. I'm not sure where you're at. Uh, just do the A, B, A, B in the center of the, of the chiastic structure. Why will they not show himself unto us as well, as unto them who shall be at Jerusalem? Yea, why will they not show himself unto this land, as well as the land of Jerusalem? Does this kind of sound a little bit like Laman and Lemuel when they said, The Lord shows no such thing unto me. Right. They're telling Samuel a Lamanite, yeah, like he's going to do something important over there. We're the most important. It should be over here. Maybe God needs our permission to do something important over in Jerusalem. This, we're being warned of what the attitudes are throughout these structures and, and you know that this attitude is connected with the great and marvelous work because they just happen to throw those words right there at the beginning and the end and put that attitude right smack in the middle. This is so cool. When Nephi quotes chapter 49 of Isaiah and I'm going to show you um, the chiasm that's going on here in the text. It, I, I've got it all spelled out for you so you can see it. But 
I love that there's a verse added in front of Isaiah 49, verse 1. And it's 1 Nephi 21, verse 1. Again, hearken, ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people. This is, <laughs> this is Lehi, Lehi, this is a Nephi talking to his people. All ye that are broken off, that are scattered abroad, who are of my people, O house of Israel. Once you become sensitive to it, you can see that all of the Book of Mormon's prophets, their hearts are stretched out and yearning for the restoration of their children in the last days. And often they plead with us, O oh, Gentiles, will you not have charity? Do you know that when Hiram Smith left to Carthage, he left his Book of Mormon, and he dog-eared the page on Ether chapter 12. O oh, ye Gentiles, I pray that you will have charity hmm. on the house of Israel. All right, so here's that chiasm in 49. Now, we saw that chapter 48 was that burnt hamburger part. Well, chapter 49 is the living greens part. This is the deliverance. This is the other side of the coin that's happening. But even here on the other side of the coin, watch this. Talks about a servant, just like we saw in 2 Nephi chapter 3. The t servant said, the Lord says to him, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. Now, this is one of four songs of salvation that are in the book of Isaiah, three of which are quoted in full in the Book of Mormon. I'm not going to tell you about the fourth one. Okay, that's a rabbit. For right now, we'll stay on track. In this one, it, it kind of gives you an insight into the heart of this servant. And yes, it can apply to all of the people of God. They're his servant too. It could apply to the Jews and the Lamanites and the ten tribes, all of those who are the people of God. But there is a context in this end time restoration where there is a person. He's an arm. He's a hand. He is a choice seer in the Book of Mormon. Here it is when Nephi is quoting 49, and he's kind of getting discouraged. He says, I've labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose. Yet my cause rested with the Lord. And then now look what the Lord says that he will do because he's faithful, even though it seems hopeless sometimes. He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to restore Jacob or Israel to him and gather them. I won honor in the eyes of the Lord when my God became my strength. Hmm. When it didn't, when it wasn't about him anymore. It was only about what God wanted him to do, no matter how it looked. And in verse 6, that's when the Lord says to him, Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant and raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel? I will also appoint you a light to the nations, that my salvation may be to the ends of the earth. And again, Nephi quoted that in the wilderness. All right, in verse 7 it says, Thus saith the Lord to him who is despised as a person and abhorred by his nation, a servant to those who are in authority, the Lord will keep faith with you. The Holy One of Israel has chosen you. At a favorable time, at an appointed time, at a due time. In the day of salvation, I will come to your aid. I have created you and appointed you to be a covenant of the people and to restore the land and reapportion the desolate estates. At a deadline. At a deadline, and there is inheritances being apportioned to the saints by a servant who is restoring the house of Israel. I and mean, we're not making up that phrase. Look at it. It's in the text. To raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel, to restore the land, 
and reapportion the desolate estates. It's all in the text. And this is what Nephi is quoting in his great and marvelous sandwich. This is the great and marvelous work. This is the work. It's both a destruction of the wicked and a deliverance of the righteous. And that is why when Pharaoh showed me Daniel's numbers and I saw the great reversal between the Antichrist and Michael at Adam and Diamond, I knew immediately. And I said to him, I said, that is exactly what Isaiah says. There is a grand reversal. Look what the Lord says. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. But Zion said, How can I be joyful? The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But he will show that he hath not. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she would not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel, scattered house of Israel, smitten house of Israel. Behold, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children will make haste against their destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. You notice... O house of Israel is actually not in Isaiah 49. It's added in the Book of Mormon. Or removed in the other, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here in 2 Nephi 6. Now we're going to get Jacob introducing our chapters. And, uh, of course, we'll just pick out highlights. 2 Nephi 6. And now I, Jacob, will speak somewhat concerning these words. The words that he's talking about are the kings and the queens of the Gentiles. Jacob's going to give us a commentary on Nephi's great and marvelous sandwich right here in chapter 6. And he says, For behold, the Lord has shown me that those who are at Jerusalem from whence we came have been slain and carried away captive. And then he tells about Jesus coming, that they, that they will actually come back to the land and that the Savior will appear and they will crucify him. And because of that, they will be driven to and fro. And thus told the angel to me. Now, I just want you to notice here, Jacob's no second fiddle to um, Nephi. They, he speaks with an angel and the Lord tells him too. He sees the, the Lord when he's young. Right? Right. For thus saith the angel, many shall be afflicted in the flesh. And... Sub be, and shall not be suffered to perish because of the prayers of the faithful. There will always be a remnant, but they will be scattered and smitten and hated. And when they come to, this is so important, when they come to a knowledge of their Redeemer, they will be gathered to the lands of their inheritance. And then here's for us. And blessed are the Gentiles, they of whom the prophet Isaiah has written, for behold, if it so be that they repent and fight not against Zion, and do not unite themselves with the great and abominable church. Two churches only, remember. Church of the devil, church of the Lamb of God. They will be saved. For the Lord God will fulfill the covenants which he has made unto his children. And for this cause, Isaiah wrote these things. All right, I love this part, and when um, Nephi is quoting verse 13, it says in Isaiah, Sing, O you heavens, and be joyful, and break out into singing. But look what it says over in the Book of Mormon. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east. From Jerusalem, where is east? Well, almost. This, the American... It could be either or. I mean, you could go along. A lot of speculation there, but go ahead. Well, what I like is that they're on an island of the sea, and they headed east <laughs> from Jerusalem. Who are in the east shall be established, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy on his afflicted. This is giving you a time frame for these verses. 
It is after the Lamanites have been smitten. Remember, the Book of Mormon came forth in 1830. The last battle was 1918. That's over 80 years after the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. They're still being smitten. But after they are smitten no more, the Lord will have comforted his people. All right, now at this point, the part that we want to pay a close attention to is that the children that thou shalt have at this time will be so much greater than the ones that you have lost. The, the, the place will not even be big enough for them. It, it's talking about here in Isaiah 49. And this is referring to the brides again that we see in Isaiah 54. By the way, Jesus is going to quote this whole chapter where you had he had his first bride, Israel, and she rejected him, and therefore the tree got cursed. And then he took a bride of the Gentiles, the church. But at this time, at this second changing of the guard, part of that church apostatizes. And part of it is numbered with the first bride as she returns. And that is all in Isaiah 54. And the children of the, in the end are going to far outnumber any that they had before. All right. Isaiah 52 and 54, you can see, are quoted in their entirety in the Search Isaiah Sandwich that we'll study later. Isaiah 53, verse 1, is alluded to in probably what I think is the most important chapter in the Book of Mormon, which is 3 Nephi, chapter 21. We'll get to it later, but it's also quoted in full in Mosiah. But here again, Jesus makes another bracket to draw our attention to the middle and in the middle he writes in a giant chiasm that he addresses to the house of Israel and a giant chiasm that he addresses to the Gentiles then quotes Isaiah 54 hook line and sinker and it's all about the end time restoration of the house of Israel what I'm trying to help us see is that most of the Book of Mormon is about the end time restoration of the house of Israel and the atonement of Jesus Christ which is what Jacob is going to expand all of chapter 9 on. Here we can see the great and marvelous work again. When we get to that chapter in 3 Nephi 21, part of that search Isaiah sandwich, look what is in the center of the chapter. Many of the Gentiles do not believe the great and marvelous work when it is declared to them. Ow! That is painful. Okay, and it's not just the lesser part. We're talking about the greater part when it's declared to him in the context right here. In verse 9, it says, And there will be among them those who will not believe it, although a man will declare it to them. Remember in Isaiah 52, Jehovah has bared his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all of the earth may see God's salvation. Now, remember I said that in this center part, there's a hint to Isaiah chapter 53, the heart of the book of Isaiah. It's right here. Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our revelation? Who, they will be not believe it. Who has believed it? On whose account has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? Then we have the servant tyrant parallelism, one of the most beautiful passages in Isaiah. Here it is again in 3 Nephi 21. Therefore it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my words, remember that the words of Christ are 3 Nephi 26. They're on the large plates of Nephi. Also the brother of Jared's vision. Also the brass plates. The records from the other tribe. When these books come forth to convince the house of Israel, who will not believe in my words, whom Jesus Christ, which the Father will cause him to bring forth to the Gentiles and shall give him power that he shall bring them forth unto the Gentiles. That, when those words of Christ come forth, is the time that it will be done even as Moses said and they will be cut off in a very real and physical way. Remember in Joseph Smith history, one verse about 41, Moroni tells Joseph Smith, when the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in, it says, but the time is not yet 
when the people will be cut off that don't believe in the words of Christ, but it will soon be. This is when it happens. All right, we see in um, Isaiah 50 that Jacob is quoting in chapter 7 that the servant, so this is another one of the servant's songs in Isaiah, that he's being smitten, he's being persecuted. And what's interesting is that on the Day of Atonement in Israel, the day that represents the deliverance of Israel, there's a goat, and he's called the scapegoat. And a special bridge led directly from the temple court to the outskirts of the city. And this bridge connected the temple complex to what is called the Mount of Anointment. And the scapegoat was led over this bridge and out into the desert. On the way, groups of people called Babylonians, they're called that, but they're really Alexandrians. I have no idea why they're called Babylonians, unless it's prophetic. They pull out the goat's hair. And they cry, take our sins and be off with you. Take our sins and go. It just is crazy to me <laughs> that they were treating that way. They were eager to urge the priest who led the scapegoat that he should not tarry or hesitate in the least, but get rid of that goat. Hmm. Now let's read what Jacob is quoting. Was my hand too short to redeem you? Have I no power to deliver my Lord Jehovah has endowed me with a learned tongue that I may know how to preach to those grown weary a word to wake them up. Remember in 2 Nephi chapter 3, it said that Joseph Smith was weak and that he would be made strong. And I said, this other guy is learned. This is where we get it. It's in Isaiah 50. My Lord Jehovah has endowed me with a learned tongue that I may know how to preach to those grown weary a word to wake them up. Morning by morning, he wakens my ear to hear as at study. My Lord Jehovah has opened my ear, and I rebel not, nor back away. I offered my back to the smiters, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I hid not my face from insult and spitting. Because my Lord Jehovah helps me, I will not be disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing I will not be confounded. Hmm. Now, of course, these servant passages apply to other servants as well, but they, with the linking word, you can see there is a specific end time context as well. It continues on. Because the Lord Jehovah helps me, I will not be disgraced. I will set my face like flint. Now, notice it's a lawsuit. Notice he's being taken to court. He who vindicates me is near me. Who has a dispute with me? Let us face one another. Who will bring charges against me? Let him confront me with them. See, my Lord Jehovah sustains me. Who then will incriminate me? Surely all shall wear out like a garment, and a moth shall consume them. So you get the idea that his enemies are trying to take him to court. Uh, let can't imagine anybody doing that to an innocent person. Who among you fears Jehovah and heeds the voice of his servant? Who, though he walk in the dark and have no light, trusts in the name of Jehovah and relies on his God? Though he walks in the dark and has no light. Now, Isaiah 57 says another thing that's interesting about him and... Um, just because we're, we're talking about this end-time person that brings forth the sealed portion and begins the massive restoration of Israel as a nation. Thus says he who is highly exalted and who abides forever, I dwell on high in the holy place, and with him who is humble and lowly in spirit, refreshing the spirits of the lowly and reviving the hearts of the humble. I will not contend forever, nor always be angry, the spirits and the souls I have made would faint before me. By his sin of covetousness, I was provoked. He kind of wanted to do it his own way. I struck him and hid my face in anger when he strayed by following the ways of his heart. Yet I have seen his conduct and I will recover him. 
I will guide him and amply console him, and those who mourn him, who partake of the fruit of the lips. Peace and well-being to those far off and to those who are near, says the Lord, who heals him. That's a direct link to 3 Nephi 21, when the Lord heals him. And we'll study that more when we get to 3 Nephi. All right, finishing up, we've talked about the righteousness and the salvation and the arms that are, are going to judge the people. Again, this is all being quoted by Nephi and by Jacob. Wherefore, they that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord will lick up the dust of their feet. And the people of the Lord shall not be ashamed, for the people of the Lord are they who wait for him. And they still wait for the coming of the Messiah. Both the Jews and the house of Israel and us Gentiles are waiting for his coming. And behold, according to the words of the prophet Isaiah again, the Messiah will set himself again the second time to recover them. Wherefore, he will manifest himself unto them in power and great glory. Remember in DNC 103, when it talks about the redemption of Zion, it says, I won't send my angel like I sent when they came out of the exodus in Egypt. I myself and my angel will go before them unto the destruction of their enemies when that day cometh that they will believe in him. And none will he destroy that believe in him. What a beautiful promise. All right, in Isaiah chapter 51 being quoted by Jacob, we have some special literary techniques going on called Isaiah ide Zion ideologies. What that means is every time you see the word Zion, as in chapter 1, verse 27, you will always see nearby, either before or after, a reference to the bad guy and the overthrow as well as to the servant figure in the end time, often with metaphorical pseudonyms that are in parallel that you can link their names up. But this was one of the first things that I did when I studied the book of Isaiah to find out if these things were real, that, that were being talked about, these code names, these pseudonyms. And when I looked and found every word Zion in Isaiah, and I looked right in the surrounding verses for the bad guy and the good guy and saw that Zion all every single time it's mentioned in Isaiah has this grand reversal going on around the birth of Zion. I knew that this wasn't something that somebody was just telling me about Isaiah. I saw that it was something that Isaiah was doing himself and that's why I encourage you. You can either do it with Zion there's a chart in the back of Isaiah Illustrated that shows you all the the different occurrences of Zion and how and the the where the good guys are and the bad guys are. Mark it yourself. See if someone is just telling you this, or if Isaiah is doing this for real. He's telling Zion is actually Isaiah's focus, the establishment of Zion, and the redemption of Israel. Here you can see in Isaiah 51, which is being quoted by Jacob, that you have Zion mentioned, and then you have the voice, the righteousness, the <laughs> salvation, and then there's the destruction and the reversal. The heavens will vanish as smoke, and the earth wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die in the manner of vermin. So again, we have the destruction and the deliverance, and we're going to see it every single time. Now here is where we come to the end of um, Isaiah 51, um, and there, we have a very interesting verse in 51 verse 9, and it says, um, let's go ahead and zoom in and read it. Awake, arise, close yourself with power, O arm of Jehovah. Again, remember from 2 Nephi 3, it says that he, the Lord, will give him power. Clothe yourself with power. Be sure yourself as in ancient times, as in generations of old. Was it not you who carved up Rahab? Rahab is poetic for Egypt. You can see it in Psalm 87, verse 4. Who, you who slew the dragon. That's also the Pharaoh. He had a dragon 
often as his symbology there. And so we're talking about the Red Sea. We're talking about going through on dry land and the power. Put, clothe yourself with power, O arm of Jehovah. Again, you remember from our last lesson that we are invoking the 72 names of God here again, except for here it's happening in an end time context. Was it not you who dried up the sea and the waters of the mighty deep and made of the ocean depths a way by which the redeemed might pass? Notice the might pass because this is another Passover. There was a Passover in ancient Egypt and then there's one when Israel comes home. And I'll show it to you in just a second. Let the ransom of Jehovah return. Let them come singing to Zion, their heads crowned with everlasting joy. And let them obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing flee away. Here again, you can see two other instances in the Book of Mormon where they call on the Red Sea and the, and the power there. And when Nephi is building the ship and he has the power to not let his brothers take him and, and kill him. And we also see it in Nephi and Lehi and Nephi and Helaman when he is given empowered to prophesy and tell them who murdered the chief judge. Here it is in Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Watch that righteous key word. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they will no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north countries and from all countries whither I had driven them. And they will dwell in their own land. Here it is in Zechariah chapter 6, just showing you that there's a righteous branch, but that in no way eclipses the Lord and Savior that he prepares the way for, because they're both mentioned right here in Zechariah 6. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he will be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both, the Lord and the branch. All righty. Here again, we see Isaiah 51, verse 9, the Rahab and the dragon. And this one I threw in here just to make everybody go, hmm. <laughs> Things that make you go. Things that make you go, hmm. Okay, so we know that this was a reference to the exodus out of Egypt. And we know that it has a nuance to the last days. But check this out. Rahab is a poetical name of Egypt. That means fierceness, insolence, and pride. Yeah. Rahab is a name that occurs only once without being hooked to the Exodus, and that's Psalm 87. That's where you can see it being used for Egypt. But here's the idea. Could this, was it not you who carved up Rahab and slew the dragon? Could this be a reference to the war in heaven as well? Because this is from Enoch the prophet, Hugh Nibley, page 173. He is quoting ancient Apocrypha, and it says, God saw that Satan, because of his boundless ambition and total lack of humility, what is Rahab? Insolence and pride. Hmm. Because of his boundless ambition and total lack of humility, could no longer be trusted with celestial power, and he commanded the angels to remove him from his office. This ordinance they performed with great sorrow and reluctance. They removed the writing of authority from his hand. They took from him his armor and all of the insignia of his priesthood and kingship. Then, with a ceremonial knife, a sickle, 
they inflicted upon him certain ceremonial blows of death, which deprived him of his full strength forever after. Read that again. Was it not you who carved up Rahab and slew the dragon? Hmm. It has a lot of interesting layers here. And the reason I put this up here is, is because always in Scripture, just because I'm showing you one way to read it, doesn't mean that it's every way, of course. And you should never believe anything I say anyway. It's not in the Scriptures. It doesn't matter. Jeremiah 30. Look at this. Just this is a timeline for when this character, this David servant character in 2 Nephi 3, the choice seer, um, bringing forth the words of Christ. Alas, for that day is great, so there is none like it, even it is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a specific period of time. But he will be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and burst thy bonds. But they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Again, I think sometimes we, we have boxes and, and we kind of might fall in that same category where Samuel the Lamanite said, God will do his own work and hopefully we'll have the Spirit of God and be a part of it. In Jacob chapter 8, um, he says, quoting Isaiah 51, These two sons are come unto thee, who will be sorry for thee, and thy desolation, and thy destruction, and the famine and sword. And by whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted, save these two. They lie at the head of the streets as a wild bull in a net, and they are full of the fury of the Lord and the rebuke of thy God. So who are these two sons that he's talking about? I told you I'd show you in Zechariah 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Quoting from Revelation 11, it's referring to the two olive trees in Zechariah 4. The olive trees that feed the olive oil that causes the light to burn for Israel, the father of the law, the Torah, and the father of the prophets, who is Elijah. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Who called fire down from heaven? Obviously. All I just... They have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Again, Elijah and the famine, we don't get the, that it was for uh, three and a half years unless we cross-reference seven, 1 Kings 17 to James 5. And when he, the famine is in 1 Kings 17, but James, the brother of Jesus Christ, tells it it was for the space of three years and six months that Elijah called that famine. But in Malachi chapter 4, it also says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, or Sinai, for all the Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So we know that Elijah was translated for a special mission in the last days. But sometimes we forget about verse 4. Verse 4 said, Remember the law of Moses, my servant. So, in Revelation 11, verses 6 and 7, it says that the other of the two witnesses has power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with plagues. It's just a little clue. Of course, we're talking about Moses. And these two are the ones that have the greatest love for Israel and will stand with her in the end. Remember the law of Moses and the statutes and the judgments, that justice can be restored again to the earth. Here's another Zion ideology in Isaiah 51. I will put my words in your mouth, and I will shelter you in the shadow of my hand. I will replant the heavens and set the earth in place, that I may say to Zion, you are my people. Now watch the time frame here, when Zion becomes his people. Rouse yourself and awaken and arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his wrath. 
drinking the dregs. To the dregs, the bowl of stupor. And again, at this point is the grand reversal when those that dug the pit will fall into the pit. This is the grand reversal of the restoration of the house of Israel and the end of the time of the Gentiles. And we're going to end in 2 Nephi chapter 10, our last chapter, where Jacob is going to re-summarize everything he said. And I know that I haven't hit chapter 9. I'll read a couple verses out of that when we're done because Jacob is going to say that none of this can take place if our Savior had not come. And we have one of the most beautiful chapters on the atonement in the Book of Mormon. If I, I, I always say the most beautiful chapter. Most beautiful. <laughs> I guess there's a lot of most beautiful you say chapters. one of, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. And now I, Jacob, speak unto you again. So he's finishing up. We're in chapter 10. He's just quoted Isaiah. He's given us the beautiful sermon on the Savior and the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ in Jacob chapter 9. Now we're going to be in chapter 10. And Jacob's going to recap and summarize. And now I, Jacob, speak unto you again concerning this righteous branch unto the house of Israel that I have spoken. For behold, the promises which he has obtained which we have obtained our promises unto us according to the flesh. So here, after all of this, Jacob is going to say, don't for a second allegorize the restoration of the house of Israel. Don't think for a second that the gospel is going to spread throughout the whole earth and everybody's going to be happily ever after. No, there's going to be a cutoff. There's going to be a reversal, and Israel will be restored for real to the lands of her inheritance and to her faith in her Savior, Jesus Christ. For behold, the promises which we have obtained are promises unto us according to the flesh. Wherefore, as it has been shown unto me that many of our children will perish in the flesh because of unbelief, as real as it is that they die is as real as it is that our children will be restored and they will come to that which will give them the true knowledge of their Redeemer. Now, in this wonderful chiasm in 2 Nephi chapter 10, I want you to count how many times it says in the flesh. There's a clue. <laughs> so you want me to count them out loud? Well, here, I'll give you one more clue. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> In addition to the two that we just read at the beginning. So five times. If you want to give a name to this chiasm in 2 Nephi chapter 10, as Jacob summarizes in all of this, it's going to happen in the flesh for real. That the kings and the queens of the Gentiles are going to bring them on their shoulders and that the promises of the Lord are great to the Gentiles and that they will be blessed and that God will fortify this land against other nations, and that there will be people fighting against this great and marvelous work when it happens. Um, it says that if you do, you'll perish, but it says that those that are fighting against it are going to try and raise up a king. And uh, if you look in element F right there, it says that the people that are trying to raise up a king are the secret works of darkness. Going God on. destroys. Yeah, and Helaman's going to have a lot more. So, the book of Helaman is going to have a lot the more. The secret to say. combinations that we now are troubled with are not too far from coming to an end. No, and they are going to try and raise up a king. They kind they of kind of already, already are. are. <laughs> I was going to say you know? that's well, pretty much yeah. in place, pretty much. But. but here's what the Lord's plan is. He says, "I, the Lord, will be their king, and a light unto them forever that hear my what." My words. My words, yeah. There's going to be words of Christ that come forth. And those that hear his words, Jesus Christ will be their king. That my covenants will be fulfilled unto the children of men while they are in the flesh. Same picture in Isaiah chapter 11. Same characters. DNC 13 says that Jesus Christ is the root and the, the stock and the stem, and that 
there's a rod that comes up from that stalk in the stem during the time of the Gentiles and that Joseph Smith is going to bring in the fullness of the time of the Gentiles but hold the phone in Isaiah chapter 10 there was a bad guy and he chops down that rod and the trees and they're burned with fire because they apostatize and there we have the great reversal and notice that part of that rod part of that fullness of the Gentiles is still alive and is still faithful and the tribes are grafted in and the house of Israel becomes one and the Gentiles that believe are numbered with them it's all over the scriptures and I just want to end with Joseph Smith that he laid the foundation he commenced the work and then in DNC 136 verse 38 which foundation he did lay and was faithful and I took him to myself and as surely as Joseph Smith was faithful there will be a restoration of the house of Israel in the flesh and Isaiah talked all about it and Nephi and Jacob are talking all about it and may we be found faithful with the kings and the queens of the Gentiles who help with that restoration is my prayer hmm. I think we see it happening in 3D Technicolor and so much we could go into blessings until <laughs> next time